Are you considering starting aripiprazole for depression? Here are six essential things you have to know to make an informed decision. My name is Matthias Hartman. I'm a board certified psychiatric physician assistant working full time in psychiatry, and I'm here to bring you the facts so you can make informed decision regarding your mental health care. First off, let's go over who can't take aripiprazole. Well, if you have an allergy, you can't take it. But that's really the only contraindication. Even if you have kidney or liver problems, it should be okay to take. Next, let's go over how aripiprazole works. And it's a very complex mechanism. It has many, many different mechanisms. We'll go over them briefly here. It's a D2 partial agonist, which means it boosts dopamine in certain parts of the brain that it, where it's low, and it decreases dopamine in certain parts of the brain where it's too high. It's also a 5-HT1A partial agonist. 5-HT just means serotonin, so you can think of serotonin 1A. 1A is a specific receptor, so it's a serotonin 1A partial agonist. And it also blocks several serotonin receptors, including 5-HT2A, 5-HT2C, 5-HT7. It has actions at D3, a little bit unclear how it works at D3. And it also blocks alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, which may cause dizziness if you get up too fast, and that's known as orthostatic hypotension. Next, let's talk about the efficacy in dosing. How well does aripiprazole work, and how do we dose this? Well, let's go over the FDA approvals first. Of course, it's FDA approved for major depressive disorder as an augmentation agent. That means it's used in addition to a standard antidepressant like a serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Lexapro or Zoloft, for example. It's also FDA approved for several other disorders as well, bipolar maintenance, acute or mixed mania, schizophrenia, autism irritability, or Tourette's. And it's often used off-label for many other psychiatric conditions, off-label just means it doesn't have an FDA approval. So how do we dose this? Well, we start at, a, at about two to five milligrams daily and increase by about five milligrams a week, but it really depends. The usual dose range for major depressive disorder is between two and 10 milligrams daily, and the max dose is generally 15 milligrams daily. Next, let's go over some guidelines, specifically the Canadian Network for Mood and Anxiety Treatments, also known as CANMAT, the 2023 guidelines, pretty new. What do they recommend? Well, they recommend aripiprazole as a first line treatment option for augmentation for difficult to treat depression. Difficult to treat depression, also known as treatment resistant depression, which means two failed prior medications used. And next, let's go over some very specific studies on aripiprazole being used as an augmentation strategy for major depressive disorder. Let's see exactly how well it works. Well, let's go over study number one here, 2008 study by Marcus and colleagues. They had a randomized controlled trial of 381 adults with major depressive disorder with at least one failed previous antidepressant trial. Remember, that's not treatment-resistant depression or difficult to treat depression. That's just one failed trial. Treatment-resistant depression is at least two. Aripiprazole was given as an augmentation medication to treat major depressive disorder, of course. Half of the people were given placebo and the study lasted for six weeks. What did we find? Well, remission, meaning the symptoms went away almost completely, was 25% for aripiprazole and 15% for placebo. Placebo, that just means something that doesn't work, but it's also a pill. So they might give someone a sugar pill, for example. The number needed to treat was 10. What does that mean? Well, if you treat 10 people with aripiprazole for major depressive disorder as an augmentation medication, the next person after that would be expected to get the desired result that we wanted from this study's results. The response for aripiprazole, response means Symptoms decreased by at least 50%. Response for aripiprazole, 32%. Placebo, 17%. And the number needed to treat was seven, which means if you give aripiprazole to seven patients, seven people, that next person after that would be expected to get the result that we want, meaning response. It's just a different way of saying the study's results. You can say 32% of people responded, or you can say the number needed to treat was seven. And a lower number needed to treat is always better. The lower, the better. For our next study here, 2009 study by Berman and colleagues. What did they do? Well, they had a randomized controlled trial, 349 adults. Again, at least one failed medication trial. 
Aripiprazole was given as an augmentation for major depressive disorder, same as the other one, half got placebo, six-week study. What did they find? Remission, 37% for Aripiprazole, 19% for placebo. Number needed to treat? Six, a little bit of a better number needed to treat than the other study. And response, what did we get? 47% response for aripiprazole and 27% for placebo. Of course, the number needed to treat is going to be better with that kind of uh, results. The number needed to treat of five. Now let's look at something a little different. A 2022 Kishimoto and colleagues meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is where you look at many different studies together and you do a bunch of statistics to look at all those separate ones and give us a combined result. So this specific meta-analysis looked at eight uh, trials about using aripiprazole, and it included 2,416 participants. So very big uh, meta-analysis looking at response rate. So response less uh, decrease of 50 percent in depression symptoms. What did they find? Well, the risk ratio was 1.54 for response. The number needed to treat was nine for response. We know what a number needed to treat of nine for response means at this point, but what does a risk ratio, RR, for 1.54 for response means? Well, that means you're 54 percent more likely to get response if you take the aripiprazole versus a placebo. That's all that means. And what did they also look for in this meta-analysis? Well, they looked at nine studies that included 2,597 participants, and they wanted to know what the remission rate of using aripiprazole was. Well, it had a risk ratio of 1.59, meaning if you took aripiprazole versus placebo, you were 59% more likely to achieve remission, pretty good, and the number needed to treat was 10. Okay, okay, cool, but what you really care about is how quickly is this gonna start working and do we need to monitor anything, any blood work or anything like that? Well, let's take a look at it. First of all, the half-life is very long for aripiprazole, 75 hours, and what does that mean? Well, if you happen to miss a dose here or there, you're not gonna have bad discontinuation side effects, which is where you might get flu-like symptoms with certain medications that have uh, short half-lives. You might just not feel well if you miss a dose. Aripiprazole, probably not gonna feel like that. It starts working in about two to four weeks for major depressive disorder, so it doesn't work right away. And what do we need to monitor? Well, we need to get some blood work. We wanna look at the hemoglobin A1C to look at your blood sugar over a three month period. We wanna get a complete blood count. We wanna get a lipid panel to look at your triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol. We also need to monitor for tardive dyskinesia, which is an abnormal movement disorder that's potentially permanent, but it's the prognosis is better if we catch it early. So that's why we always ask at each visit and we do standard assessments to check for this. If you wanna learn more about tardive dyskinesia, click on this video on screen to learn all about that. I made a video specifically about that. We wanna monitor weight and BMI because aripiprazole can cause increased weight in some people. It doesn't often cause that, but there, there is that risk. In a minority of people, they do gain a lot of weight. Now, of course, although aripiprazole has a long half-life of 75 hours, it is recommended to taper off, meaning you stop the aripiprazole slowly with the guidance of your medical provider. Next, let's go over some common side effects. This is what people wanna know. Sure, it might work. What are the side effects? Let's go over these here. And we have percentages too. How often do these happen? And we're starting from the most common to the least common. You can get a headache, lipid problems. Remember I told you about that increased LDL, increased triglycerides, you can get increased glucose, sugar problems, trouble sleeping, anxiety, nausea, restlessness, tremor, which is like a fine shake, constipation, dizziness, weight gain. See a minority of people there, two to 8%. But those people who do get it, they might gain quite a bit of weight. And tardive dyskinesia, abnormal movement disorder, potentially permanent. Next, let's go over some rare but serious side effects. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome. That's where dopamine gets blocked too hard. You got no dopamine in the system and it can cause symptoms such as confusion, fever, muscle rigidity, and it could potentially be dangerous. You can get seizures, suicidal thoughts, and this is only for people less than 25 years old. And I made a video all about suicidal thoughts. We go very in depth. Check out that video on screen here if you wanna learn more about that. But what you need to know, any 
psychiatric medicine has this warning on there of suicidal thoughts. It doesn't matter what the medication is, if it's for psychiatric reasons, it'll have that warning. Impulse control problems can sometimes happen. Aripiprazole is a partial agonist, meaning it increases dopamine in some parts, decreases in others. So rarely it can cause some problems with impulse control because it might increase dopamine in certain parts of the brain. And lastly, there's an increased risk of death and cerebral vascular accident, that's CVA, which is just, it just means stroke, in people with dementia specifically. And lastly, let's go over some special considerations. So what are some positives? Well, there's not much weight gain to be expected with aripiprazole. Remember, it happens in about two to 8% of people. That's pretty good. That's a pretty low percentage of people. There is a long-acting injectable option as well. So you might not have to take the aripiprazole by mouth every day. So you know it works well for you. You could potentially switch to an injectable, which can last anywhere from one to two months. It is cheap, it's generic, it's been around for a while, it's been studied quite a bit, and it costs about 18 to $22 a month, depending on the dose, of course. And of course, a really big negative is the risk of tardive dyskinesia, abnormal movement disorder, potentially permanent. So you always have to take that into consideration. And that's it, folks. That's all the most important things you need to know about aripiprazole. What do you want me to cover next? Leave a comment down below letting me know if there's any topic you want me to cover. And if you enjoyed this video, you might like this video next on supertherapeutic dosing, a little known method used by experts to treat major depressive disorder. See you there.